F1 versus P1 is a test that we spent a very long time trying to pull together. Just trying to sort out the insurance for £10 million worth of McLarens isn't exactly easy. At first, we thought we might get a couple of cars together in Switzerland, then Wales, and then, to be honest, after several months of plotting, we would probably have settled for an hour on the roads near Woking, given how difficult it seemed to be. But then a very kind owner came up trumps. Would we like to drive his cars in the south of France? Well, needless to say, we were on a budget flight to Marseille almost before we'd put the phone down. This spectacularly serpentine piece of tarmac is the D2, a road not far from the stripy Paul Ricard circuit. It is stunning, although cars with power-to-weight ratios in excess of 550 brake horsepower per tonne devour even medium-length straights, with the disdain of Mr Creosote popping the first canopy in its mouth. Nonetheless, automotive amphitheatres don't come much better. The F1 is still, after, what, getting on for sort of 23 years now, just the most incredible car to drive. 627 brake horsepower from that 6 litre V12 behind me, the all aluminium, double overhead cam, four valves per cylinder, designed by Paul Rocher for, by BMW. Absolutely, it, it properly takes your breath away. It's the most exciting engine. Being naturally aspirated, I don't care what anyone says, on a road car, on the road. It gives you such throttle response. It's staggering. It makes the car feel like it weighs absolutely nothing. Curb weight from McLaren F1 is 1137 kilos officially. Although this has got the sports exhaust on it so it might be just a touch lighter. And it just, it feels like it's a cage of just... It's staggering. I just don't think you'd ever get bored of this car. The steering is quite heavy on this one, I have to say. It's heavier than XP5. XP5 is the 100,000 mile prototype, still owned by McLaren, that we used for our analogue supercar test back in 2013. It is also the car that was used to set the then record top speed at Air Alessian. A standard F1 will actually run into its limiter at 231 miles an hour, but for the record, they removed the limiter and it ran on to 243. Apparently it went through a slight weave at about 230 miles an hour, but then it settled down again as Andy Wallace says, in his inimitable carbon fashion. I think the best place to actually hear the engine is from the passenger seats, because you get the induction from the roof scoop going down literally next to your head. But I'll settle for the driver's seat. The gear shift in the F1 is well, it's quite tricky. The first sort of shifts in the morning, you have this horrible suspicion you might be about to go from second to first, and you really, really, really don't want to go from second to first. But once you're used to it, and once you're aware of, just to say, how tight it is across that gate, then you can flash it through. And it's a really lovely, snickety little shift. engine would just never get boring. You can probably hear the squealing of the brakes. They are um, certainly the weakest part of the F1, as you might imagine. McLaren wanted, or well, they certainly toyed with the idea of putting ceramic brakes on the F1, but they just couldn't get them to work. Back in the early 1990s, it just wasn't going to be feasible for a road car. They didn't work at low speeds at all. So they had to go with steels. But the trouble was, the regulations at the time said that they had to 
to repeated stops from 80% of their maximum speed, which is quite a trial in the McLaren F1. As well as the usual run-of-the-mill details like gold in the engine bay, this particular F1 has a few individual things. You can see the plumbed-in TomTom sat-nav, and I've mentioned the sports exhaust already, but this car also has a removable steering wheel, some extra 12-volt sockets, and as it gets used on a regular basis, it has a headlight upgrade, which was extremely welcome when night fell at the end of the test. Apart from these relatively minor details, everything else is standard, and there really isn't anything that you'd want to change from the original early 90s design. The whole project famously started as three chairs laid out in a delta formation, and then it went onto a wooden buck, etc. And it is an absolute masterpiece of packaging. The seating position is just magical, though. It really does put you right at the centre of everything. And you can look so far through the corners without being hindered by the A-pillars. One thing about the central driving position, you might notice most of the interior is a fairly muted colour. It's the same in all F1s. But if you look at the central panel of the seat that I'm sitting in, it's usually a bright colour. And that's because Gordon Murray wanted people, when they looked into the car, to only focus on the driver's seat. A bit like looking into, well, a single-seater. It really is so mechanical, this car. You can tell that everything, you know, pedals, steering, they're all connected to something. There's no, there's no electronics getting involved here. And the throttle response. <laughs> It's my birthday today. I don't think I could have a much better present than this. In fact, if I was going for one last drive, I think I'd want this throttle response and this engine. Is there anything better in the world? I don't think so. It seems almost unfair for any other car to have to try to live up to the almost religious experience of an F1 but that is exactly the task given to this. So here we are. Two cars separated by one letter in 20 years. From F1 to P1. First things that strike you, well, similarities. If you look just down as you get in, you'll see that this is chassis plate number 46, which matches the F1 because all the owners of F1s were given the chance to buy the same number of P1. This is also the same colour, it's Genesis Blue. Genesis, uh, Genesis Park and Genesis Building were where McLaren was based when they were building the F1, so it's quite a nice link between the two cars. It's a beautiful colour as well, a really sort of oily blue. Things that have obviously changed when you look around the car, well, carbon fibre to me is the biggest change. I mean. You look at the rear diffusers on both cars and the intricacy of the P1 is just extraordinary. I mean, it must have, it would have blown the designers' minds if they could have seen what you'd be able to do with carbon fibre by the time the P1 came along. Other things, well, the rear lights. I mean, the lights from the F1 were from a Bova coach, bizarrely. And actually, they, <laughs> they'd been on a TVR before and, and the designers thought, well, obviously they must have been homologated for cars then. No, TBR had just, just done it. But compared to the wonderful swooping LEDs that you get on the back of the P1, it's very different. The faces of the two cars, I think, look surprisingly similar, actually. Both of these wonderful sort of high cheekbones. <laughs> oh, this is so fast. So what's this like to drive? Well, compared to the F1, it is obviously supremely easy, basically, which you wouldn't expect for something that has over 900 brake horsepower. But jumping out of the F1, this really does feel like an absolute pussycat. You've obviously got light steering, so it's easy to sort of overwork the front tires, actually, because you know, you, it's, it's so easy to have so much input. Gear change is obviously phenomenally easy. I mean, 
it'll do it itself if you want. And the other big thing, of course, is see we can do this. And travel along in electric mode, which is um, fairly freaky. Fire up the engine again, I think. Now, the noise is obviously such a massive thing with the F1, and the P1, it can't compete. But it is interesting. You, you get all these wonderful sort of little chirrups and then snuffles and so depending what sort of speed you're doing and where the throttle is you get all sorts of interesting things going on behind you which is is fascinating really and then of course you press active fire everything up and it turns into a whole other beast On the road where you're not right up in the top of the rev range like you are on track, you do notice there is turbo lag, whilst these turbos are spawning up on a 3.8 V8. As a result, unless you're in full attack, torque-filled track mode, you don't quite get the instant throttle response out of a corner that you do with a naturally aspirated F1. Although, inevitably, 903 brake horsepower will reel in the tail of the F1 as the straight continues. It's a mark of how well telegraphed the rear end is, and how confident you feel in it that you can actually squeeze the throttle on, because otherwise you'd be terrified of all that boosted torque coming in so quickly. The performance, well, obviously, in 20 years, the 0-60 mile an hour time has dropped by 0.4 of a second to 2.8 seconds and a fully standing started P1 for the top speed. It's just 217. Terrible. What a car though. I'm amazed by the similarities and the differences between these two cars. And in their own way, each one is a very, very special thing. And this has been a very, very good day. Whether driving quickly or pottering slowly, the wonder of jumping from one to the other never wore off throughout our time with these two. The P1 makes its outrageous performance seem insanely accessible after the F1. The ability to brake so late, change down and turn in all at the same time is mind-blowing after the more conventional sequence of inputs that you have to follow in the F1. The lateral grip of the newer car also makes progress breathtakingly surgical at anything less than maximum attack. P1 slicing through corners fast and flat. Yet even after the sort of flame-spitting drive that leaves you tingling for hours, it cannot overshadow the engineering genius and sheer character of the older car. The yelping, howling F1 lights up your senses like nothing else communicating with you through every point of contact and asking more of you in every situation. Whether accelerating, changing up, braking, changing down, cornering, or just getting in and out. It is a car that was ahead of its time when it was created. And in spite of the relentless march of time and progress, you get the feeling that it may never be surpassed. If you want to see more on what it's like to drive a McLaren F1, then just click on the link to our analog supercars test on the left. And if you want to see the P1 being driven to its absolute limit on track against the Porsche 918 Spyder, then click on the link on the right.